you for joining us live here on ABN on a new episode of Debate Night. We are live in the studio, and uh, my name is Summer Goriel. I will be your moderator of the evening. We have an exciting program for you this evening with two dynamic speakers. I'd like to introduce to you, um, for, first of all, joining me in the studio, we have Robert Spencer. Thank you, sir, for joining me. Um, on the show tonight. Uh, Robert is the director of Jihad Watch, a program of the David Horowitz Freedom Center and the author of 12 books including uh, two New York Times bestsellers, The Truth About Muhammad and The Politically Incorrect Guide to Islam and the Crusades. Uh, his latest book is Did Muhammad Exist? An Inquiry into Islam's Obscure Origins. Uh, Spencer has led seminars on Islam and Jihad for the United States Central Command, United States Army Command, and General Staff College, the U.S. Army's Asymmetric Warfare Group, the FBI, the Joint Terrorism Task Force, and the U.S. Intelligence uh, Community. Also joining me this evening is Mubin Sheikh. Thank you, sir, for joining us on the program. Thank you for having me. And uh, Mubin is a former radical Muslim who turned away from his views after the 9-11 attacks. And soon thereafter, he went to undertake additional uh, studies in Arabic and Islamic studies in Syria. Uh, upon his return in 2004, he became an undercover operator uh, for domestic security intelligence in Canada and was the primary fact witness in the public prosecution of 11 aspiring terrorists. Uh, since his work, he's obtained a master's a uh, degree in uh, intelligence and counterterrorism and is now undertaking his PhD in psychology at the University of Liverpool. Uh, he currently teaches as a professor of public safety and police studies in Toronto, Canada. Thank you uh, to you both for uh, joining me on the program. Uh, tonight's topic is a, um, a, a heated topic and so we'll get right into it. The topic is the, the Quran teaches warfare against um, and sub, sub subjugation of unbelievers. Again, the Quran teaches warfare against and subjugation of unbelievers. Um, of course, Robert will be uh, arguing in the affirmative and Mubin will be arguing in the negative. And um, just real quick, the structure of the show, we will have um, an opening statement from both speakers, a, uh, two rebuttals, a crossfire, and then closing statements. And then at that time, we will uh, open up the phone lines for the audience to call in and uh, ask your questions and uh, just provide us your comments on tonight's debate. And of course, as always, the studio line is open here at ABN, which is 248-416-1300, 248-416-1300. Um, at this time, I will uh, provide the uh, first opening statement to uh, Mobin. You have seven minutes, Mobin, to provide uh, the audience your opening statement, and you can uh, start whenever you're ready. Okay, I'm ready now. I've started my own stopwatch, so. Uh, thank you very much for having me. First of all, I uh, begin in the name of the one God of Abraham, Moses, David, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon all the prophets, known and unknown. Secondly, uh, thanks for the introduction for Robert as well. One of my aims has been to dismantle some of the uh, false intelligence, bad intel that Robert's been giving the intelligence community in the U.S. Uh, I am, in fact, on my way to see you on in next month. Uh, the FBI, counterterrorism division, etc. Basically, what's happened is this kind of narrative that Robert Spencer has been promoting has become very destructive and harmful for counterterrorism purposes. Um, it is depicting an entire community as suspect and hostile. And it's easy to say that while most Muslims don't do this, but Islam teaches this. And in, the implication is that while most of us are not right Muslims, we should be blowing ourselves up. But let me just make it very easy, I think, for all of us in that Robert's argument will fall apart very easily as soon as a person can show even one verse in which the non-believers are not supposed to be attacked or harmed. If it's all about war and subjugation, my first question would be, please write this down, I'm expecting an answer. How is it even possible that the Quran talks about peace treaties if... It's all about war and subjugation. Point number two. You know, Robert really likes to quote chapter 9, verse 29. Fight those who do not believe in Allah in the last day and so on. And one of the things that Robert does uh, a lot of the times is he takes verses out of their context. And I was, I was amused to, uh, to read some of the comments, uh, Robert, on uh, Jihad Watch. Uh, one of them was... Uh, the Muslim guy doing public safety, isn't that like the, the, the fox guarding the hen house? And I mean, what can I say? I love chicken. 
Um, you know, but to, to associate being Muslim and there being some, some problem between the two, I, I, I really need to speak out against that. So if you look at chapter 9, and you can go right to the early verses. So chapter, uh, chapter 9, verse 4, verse 6, 7, and 10, they will all talk about pagans who are violating their treaties. This is not about just fight everyone, you know, no qualifiers, but it's referring to pagans who broke their treaties with the Muslims, because then you will see in verse 4, uh, those pagans with whom you have entered into an alliance and, important point, who have not subsequently failed you nor aided anyone against you, fulfill your engagements with them. So you see, it's not possible for Islam, for the Quran to teach wholesale fighting against anyone who's not Muslim just because they're not Muslim. To quote that verse, Robert, as Robert does, 929, over and over, as if by sheer repetition it becomes fact, you, you really have to look at the verses that come before it. This is what being in context means. So as I just did, I showed you verse 4. You can read verse 5, um, verse 6. All of it is look, like, look at verse 6. If, once, if one amongst the pagans asks you for asylum, grant it to him so that he may hear the word of Allah and then escort him to where he can be secure. That is because they are men without knowledge. So it's showing you again that uh, there's certainly, there's no instruction to just wholesale go out and just start killing people. Uh, I'll give you another verse from the Quran. Um, Do not let your hatred of a people cause you to be unjust to them. Rather, you must be just to everyone. This is, what, this is why Allah said, be just, that is closer to piety. Uh, on that verse, do not let enmity between you and others cause you to be unjust in your dealings and rulings with them su su such that you oppress them due to the enmity that is between you. So it's telling you, you should not be doing this. Um, and one of my favorite ones, Al-Qurtubi, he's a scholar who quote, from the 12th century, he's giving a, a, an exegesis statement on this verse. And again, you're going to find, I know Robert uh, does this. He'll quote some scholars from here, some scholars from there, and this is good. The problem is when you find other scholars saying other things. It's one thing to make the argument that Islam or the Quran teaches war and subjugation of non-believers, and there are no verses that speak of, you know, qualifying statements or peace treaties or anything like that. So Al-Qurtubi, regarding that verse, he says... This verse also proves that the disbelief of non-Muslims must not prevent us from being just to them. And it is not permissible for us to retaliate in the same manner, even if they kill our women and children and cause sorrow to befall us. It is not permissible for us to act likewise with the intention of making them feel grief and sorrow. So you see, and I'm on five minutes running up to 30 seconds. I've already shown you from chapter 9 itself. I haven't even gone into the other chapters because, you know, I find it very strange that Robert maintains this argument when there are so many verses in the Quran which enjoin one towards peace, good conduct, righteousness. In fact, what is most ironic from this is Robert's argument that the Quran teaches war and subjugation of non-Muslims because they're non-Muslims is pretty much the same argument that Al-Qaeda makes and other Islamically motivated terrorists. So, and, and it's, it's interesting because I actually used to subscribe to a lot of these views. So, so when Robert keeps perpetuating these ideas, it's, I'm, I'm kind of reminded of myself when I was a little bit younger and didn't really look at the verses in their context, especially the verses that directly precede the verses that you're quoting. Um, Secondly, and I'm sure we'll, we'll get back to this, I'm running on six and a half now, uh, the history itself shows that Muslims did not just go around killing everyone wholesale. Uh, I'm going to quote to you the example of Umar, the Caliph Umar in Jerusalem. Uh, you know, he sieged Jerusalem. They didn't attack and slaughter everyone in there. Uh, he sieged Jerusalem. And, and in one of the greatest acts to, to repudiate the Christian, the Roman Christian expulsion of Jews from Jerusalem invited the Jews back to Jerusalem. We are run uh, uh, 10 minutes or 10 seconds. So you have the verses, you have the history. Go ahead. 
Thank you, Mubin. Uh, Robert, Mike's all yours for your opening statement. Yes, thank you, Ruben. Mubin, for your uh, kind and gracious in, uh, opening statement. Uh, just a few of the numerous inaccuracies, distortions, and outright falsehoods in it are among them the first thing about the, uh, the context. Let's, let's go to the context. Let's look at the context. According to Asawi ibn Juzai and many others, this verse, 929, and maybe I should actually start with quoting 929 just so that everyone knows what exactly we're talking about. Uh, Fight against those who believe not in Allah, nor in the last day, nor forbid that which has been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, and those who acknowledge not the religion of truth, even among the people of the book, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Now, according to these Islamic authorities, and I invite you to uh, give me others that contradict this, uh, he's, they say this ayat was revealed when the Messenger of Allah was commanded to fight the Byzantines. When it was sent down, the Messenger of Allah prepared for the expedition to Tabuk, which of course became the uh, whole setting for the revelation of chapter 9 of the Quran, which was the last major chapter to be revealed with serious doctrinal content. Now, in 929, we find uh, in chapter 9 in general, we find uh, the, of course, the notorious verse of the sword, slay the unbelievers wherever you find them, and we find this verse about fighting even the people of the book, that is primarily Jews and Christians, until they submit as inferiors to the rule of the Muslims. Now, as far as uh, the context goes, you were saying that there ought to be some recognition given about the language about peace treaties in the first part of the chapter. Now, uh, it's very important to note that there is a peace treaty that's offered to the people of the book in that particular verse. If they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued, then there's peace with the Muslims. But that means that they submit to the dimma, to the contract of protection, which was institutionalized discrimination against non-Muslims, against the Jews and Christians, forbidding them to build new houses of worship or repair old ones, to have authority over Muslims. They had to pay this special tax that the non-Muslims, that the Muslims did not have to pay, and so on. Now, that, according to Islamic law, is justice. So when Qurtabi says that uh, even our dis their disbelief doesn't prevent our being just to them, there is nothing in Qurtabi, and I challenge you to quote it if it's there, but it isn't, that Qurtabi does not say, don't fight them, don't make them pay the jizya, don't make them submit. As a matter of fact, he says just the opposite. But as far as Qurtabi is concerned, that's justice. So being just to everyone means making the Jews and Christians submit as inferiors, that is to be subjugated, as according to the de debate topic tonight, they are to be subjugated under the rule of Islamic law. Now, were th had the Byzantines attacked the Muslims? No, they had not. M Muhammad moved, according to Islamic tradition, against the Byzantine garrison at Tabuk entirely unprovoked. And were the people there pagans? No, they were, they were Christians. They were Christians of the Byzantine Empire. So when we look actually at the historical context, of the passage, we find that it actually is calling for an attack that was completely unprovoked. So when you say that the attack was only uh, when we, we only fight when we're attacked and we only fight against the pagans, that's actually not at all so in connection with this verse. Also, there are, uh, Ibn Juzai says that this verse is a command to fight the people of the book, denying their belief in, because they deny that Allah is the uh, true God and Muhammad is his messenger. And so the fight is because they do not believe. That is the reason for it. The, the subjugation then follows. Uh, the Tafsir al-Jalalain says that w when chapter 9 verse 29 specifies that Muslims must fight against those who follow not the religion of truth, it means that Muslims must fight against those who do not follow Islam, which is firm and abrogates other religions. And Ibn Kathir says that this is because the non-Muslims were in bad faith and they have to be made to feel their bad faith. They have to be made to feel the sting of the punishment of Allah because of their rejection of Allah and Muhammad and Islam by being subjugated under these various laws. Asawi specifies that the payment of the jizya signifies that non-Muslims are humble and obedient to the judgments of Islam. Asayudi says that the jizya is not taken from someone in a state of hardship, although many times in many places it was. And sometimes the, the, the people of the book, when they had to pay this tax, 
We're subject to various humiliations. We're slapped, we're spat upon, and so on because they had to feel themselves subdued in accord with the, uh, with, with the uh, command of the Quran. Ibn Kathir says that the dhimmis must be degraced, humiliated, disgraced, humiliated, and belittled. Therefore, Muslims are not allowed to honor the people of the dhimma or elevate them above Muslims, for they are miserable, disgraced, and humiliated. Now, there are many, many other uh, Quran commentators and Islamic scholars who say this kind of thing. You predicted that I would quote them, and I will go on quoting them. But the problem is that the fact that there are others who might say otherwise does not mitigate the fact that Muslims are actually acting upon these verses all around the world today. It's obvious. Now, you say, well, you're just endorsing the extremist view. No, I'm reporting on the fact that what you call the extremist view is frighteningly mainstream, and that Christians are being persecuted in Nigeria, in Egypt, in Pakistan, in Iraq, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, and elsewhere because of Muslims understanding the, this passage and chapter 9 in general and the Quran in general and Muhammad saying, I have been commanded to fight until people, uh, against people until they acknowledge that there is no God but Allah and that I am his messenger. Muslims are acting upon these understandings. So it's all very well to say that, well, there are alternative views. But what would really be the response of someone who actually endorsed the alternative views and did not agree with the idea that non-Muslims ought to be waged war against and subjugated as inferiors, humiliated and disgraced under the rule of Islamic law and denied basic rights, it would seem that it would be far more important to be talking to the Muslims who believe these things and trying to convince them that their understanding of Islam is wrong rather than uh, your, your, statement was, your opening statement was full of attacks on me as if I originated these things. Well, you know, you know as well as I do, Muslims aren't listening to me. Muslims are listening to the authorities that I quoted and many others like them. And the unfortunate fact is that nowhere in the Islamic world is there a mosque or an Islamic school or any Muslim organization in the United States or Canada or Europe that has any kind of program to teach that the understanding of Islam held by Al-Qaeda and held by these people that you call extremists and blame me for reporting on their activities, nowhere is there a program showing that those, that understanding of Islam is wrong. And yet young Muslims are falling prey to it left and right and falling prey to it all over the world. This is a scandal and a horror of unimaginable proportions. And the difficulty that you have is that you're going against the, uh, an understanding of Islam that is very mainstream. I'm out of time? You are out of okay. time. I have Thanks. to turn the mic back over. Uh, Mubin, it is all yours now for your first rebuttal. Go right ahead. Mubin? Mubin, are, are you still with us? Oh, sorry about that. I was on mute. My bad. Oh, that's okay. Uh, the mic is now all yours for your first rebuttal. Okay, here we go. So thank you very much, uh, Robert. And I did not mean to say that uh, you are to blame for these, for these perspectives. They do exist. Um, there are a number of points that, that I wanted to touch on. You I mean, you quoted Ibn Jawzi. First of all, it's pronounced Jawzi. Uh, Ibn al-Qayyim al-Jawzi. Uh, I mean, like I said, if you quote me one scholar giving that interpretation, that doesn't mean anything. What that tells me is, is this guy understood it in the way that you're saying. And that's fine. I am very well aware that you have these scholars who are writing, you know, 1,000 plus years ago. They're going to write according to the, the conditions and the understandings they have at that time. So Ibn, you quoted Ibn Jawzi saying one thing. I mean, I started off quoting Al-Qurtubi saying the exact same thing. You asked, where do you find somebody saying this? And, and I quoted specifically, this proves that the disbelief of non-Muslims must not prevent us from being unjust to them. Okay, so, so, that, so that's one thing. And you talked about dhimmi discrimination. I'll get to that because the issue of dhimmi is a larger issue. I just wanted to stick to the verses really. Uh, Muslims are acting according to those understandings you were saying. Now, I mean, you're right. Uh, those Muslims who act according to those, to those understandings are who? Are terrorists, Al-Qaeda type especially. And this is why we have Muslims who are refuting this and saying, no, this is not the correct Islam. And I cannot believe that you just made that statement 
there is no organization that has, has a program in which there, these views are being denounced or showing people that these views are, I, I cannot believe you made that statement because there are many, many organizations in not only the US, not only the UK, but in Canada. In fact, you can actually do a quick Google search. If you were to do Toronto mosque detox, uh, it'll show up an article, it'll bring up an article that my father, or my father is involved with the mosque that he runs uh, in directly combating these false interpretations. So, so the idea that there are no organizations doing these programs, I'm going to say that you just haven't looked hard enough and that if any have shown themselves to at least suggest that they're doing so, you will shut them down. In fact, I saw on the Twitter feed, my jihad, you know, we had Muslims who were coming on there to say that, listen, terrorism is not my jihad. We're trying to differentiate between, uh, you know, ethics of war, just war, because, you know, we're not pacifists, to differentiate between just war and terrorism. We say this terrorism extremism is one thing, but what happened is some of your, your, your followers or whatever they are, your fans, they hijacked the, the hashtag. Uh, so it shows you that even if Muslims are trying to do so, you know, there are elements that will try to shut us down and then say, look, the Muslims aren't saying anything. So this is completely false. Uh, returning to uh, Muslims, or, or sorry, is mainstream. You're saying this view has become mainstream. Listen, you know, I have a hat behind me. It says NYPD. I got that hat from Mitch Silber, the former head of the NYPD Intel Intelligence Analysis Unit. Uh, and after all their spying, casting a wide net, how many plots did they uncover? Zero. So when you say that it's mainstream, I, I expect to see a lot more cases of extremism, violence, extremism, using these verses as justification. But in fact, you don't find that. Uh, the same thing with the FBI, you know, and there are, there are a number of differences of opinion. Some say, look, you know, there are all these plots. Uh, others say, look, well, there are all these plots, but the, uh, um, the large reason why these plots came to the knowledge of the FBI is because of Muslims themselves. So, so to try to separate Muslim involvement from counterterrorism is a very uh, dangerous thing, I would say, because it alienates and isolates everyone else, the larger Muslim community. If you want to convince them to help you, it, it doesn't help to, to castigate all of them. Uh, so when you say this is a mainstream view that, that Muslims have, this is, again, completely false. This is proven false by the intelligence community itself. Uh, so... So that's another point. Uh, so two points, which I'm really surprised that you made. One was this mainstream statement, and the other is that there is no organization uh, that has a program denoun denouncing uh, violent extremism. Uh, I'm running on four and a half. I think I have six minutes. Yeah, just on Vimy discrimination, you talk about. Yeah, yeah, just on Vimy discrimination. Uh, it is true that if you look at hundreds of years ago, the conditions, we would see them as discriminatory. They are certainly not at the level or human rights, even human rights development, only begun, only began to, to, to arrive at the place it has arrived. I mean, I can look in Canada itself. In and Mobin, I'm oh. sorry to cut you off. Uh, the, okay. the rebuttal is actually five minutes, but we'll come back okay, to no you problem. for a uh, second rebuttal. Um, okay. Mike's all yours. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, you said that uh, you had produced a scholar who said something different. Actually, you didn't. And you did not address my point. Uh, I pointed out that Qurtubi only said that Muslims should give justice to the non-Muslims. But I pointed out that the concept of justice in Islamic law encompasses the Sharia understanding that the dhimmis are to be subjugated in accord with the Quran. And so for Qurtubi to say that we have to be just just means we have to enforce Islamic law. There is nothing in Qurtubi, and I challenge you again to produce it and quote it, that says that, non -Mus that Muslims should not fight against and subjugate non-Muslims. As a matter of fact, he says just the opposite. And as far as the organizations that are fighting against uh, this understanding of jihad, it's, it's really, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's comical to me that you would name the My Jihad campaign, which is run by a Hamas-linked Muslim Brotherhood front group, the Council on American Islamic Relations, that has resisted every counter-terror effort that has ever been proposed or implemented anywhere in the United States and has uh, uh, undertaken a large-scale effort to get uh, Muslims not to cooperate 
with the uh, FBI. You mentioned Twitter. Go on, uh, I, I don't know if you follow Zafra Bilou of uh, CARE San Francisco, but she's routinely tweeting out that Muslims should not talk to police, not talk to law enforcement. Why? What have you got to hide? I tell you, if there were terrorist activity going on in my church, I would invite the police in and help them find the, the terrorists. And so uh, all this closing of ranks, it's very suspicious. And to uh, name this group that is sponsoring the My Jihad campaign as some evidence, it's, it's, it's risible. The My Jihad campaign is a cynical and deceptive whitewash designed to fool people into complacency about the jihad threat and make them think, oh, well, jihad is just getting in your exercise or uh, making friends. And in, in reality, there are armed jihadis fight, fighting jihad warfare against non-Muslims all around the world today. The fact that somebody in Chicago or San Francisco thinks that jihad means getting exercise doesn't do anything to challenge those jihadis. It only is directed toward non-Muslims. If CARE really wants to fight against the understanding of jihad that Muslims all too often hold that involves violence and subjugation, then let them run their ads in Cairo or Riyadh or Baghdad or Kabul. But in Chicago and San Francisco, come on. And in any case, uh, it is unfortunately a mainstream idea. The fact that uh, the nothing was found in New York at a particular time and place establishes nothing. New York is the greatest city on earth indeed, but it is not the whole earth. And there are armed jihadis in all, uh, every continent, and there are, they are waging violent jihad against non-Muslims in uh, the places I enumerated before, Nigeria, Egypt, Pakistan, Indonesia, and elsewhere. And so it is unfortunately quite mainstream. You said, well, these are thousand-year-old authorities. I have uh, authorities, I don't know if I have time, but I will quote from all the schools of Sunni Muslim jurisprudence, the Maliki, Hanafi, Hanbali, and Shafi'i, and they all say these things. And you could say, well, these are old authorities. Okay, find me new ones where those schools of jurisprudence teach something other than this. Uh, the uh, Ibn Khaldun, who was a Maliki uh, jurist, he said, in the Muslim community, the holy war is a religious duty because of the universalism of the Muslim mission and the obligation to convert everybody to Islam either by persuasion or by force. Ibn Taymiyyah was a Hanbali jurist, and he said, since lawful warfare is essentially jihad, and since its aim is that the religion is God's entirely and God's word is uppermost, therefore, according to all Muslims, those who stand in the way of this aim must be fought, and so on and so on. But there was one other point that you made before we go on, and I can quote more and will. But you said that the dimmi was also something, the dimma is something of the past. It's not. The Egyptian Copts just recently were threatened with the reimposition of the dimma and the reimposition of this institutionalized dis system of discrimination, subjugation, and harassment. And they took that very seriously, such that an, Egypt an Egyptian Coptic leader responded to the Salafis who were saying this in Egypt by saying, we will resist to the point of martyrdom. In Gaza, Hamas spokesmen have said that as soon as they consolidate their power fully over the entirety of the Palestinian territories, they too will reimpose the jizya and the dimmi system. And it is something that other Islamic authorities have spoken about elsewhere in the world, not 500 years ago, not 1,000 years ago, but today. And so it is something that is a very live system. And it is based on their understanding that the Quran teaches warfare against and subjugation of non-Muslims. Thank you, Robert. And at this time, we have to take our first break of the evening. Again, our lines are open. Uh, please give us a call at the studio at 248-416-1300. When we return, we will get uh, right back into our rebuttals, um, our crossfire, and then our closing statements, and then open up the lines for you, the audience, to call in and ask your toughest questions to both Robert and Mubin. Uh, we'll be right back. Stay with us. Uh, you're watching Debate Night Live on ABN. Hello, this is Sam Shamoon from the Jesus or Muhammad show, one half of the team with David Wood. I'm here exhorting my brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ who've been blessed by the programs at ABN, especially by the Jesus or Muhammad show, to consider and prayerfully consider 
to partner with us financially because, as you know, ABN is a viewer-supported satellite station. In order for us to continue to broadcast the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, not just to Christians, but also to Muslims, and not just to Muslims, but to those who are sitting on the fence and are considering embracing a, a worldview or seeking after God, ABN wants to reach these people but can only do so with your financial support. So I'm encouraging my brothers and sisters to come alongside ABN and make a financial contribution to continue Jesus and Muhammad and other shows with the purpose of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, seeing Christians get strengthened in their faith, Muslims coming to saving faith in Jesus, and others turning to Christ as their only hope and Savior. But again, we cannot do this if the support does not come in to continue to broadcast these shows. So would you please consider prayerfully asking God whether He'd have you support us on a regular basis so that we continue these programs and continue to bless the people of God, preach the truth of the gospel to the non-Christians, including Muslims, so that in everything we say and do that Jesus Christ will be glorified and that His gospel will spread throughout the entire world. Would you please join us financially? Thank you so much. Welcome back to ABN Live on Debate Night. Our topic this evening is the Quran teaches warfare against and subjugation of unbelievers. Uh, arguing in the affirmative, we have Robert Spencer. And uh, arguing in the negative, we have Mubin Sheikh. Thank you again uh, for joining us both on the, on the show. And we'll get right into um, our second rebuttal. Uh, Mubin, it's all, the mic's all yours, and you have uh, five minutes whenever you're ready. Ready. Okay, so we need to come back to uh, the verses on jihad. One thing that is not uh, disagreed upon or there's no difference of opinion is the first verse that was revealed regarding jihad, and that's uh, chapter 22, verse 39. And it says, To those against whom war is made, to those against whom war is made, permission is given to fight because they are wronged, and verily Allah is most powerful for their aid. They are those who have been expelled from their homes in defiance of right, for no cause except that they say our Lord is Allah. And again, we're talking about the context of pagans and otherwise hostile forces to the early nascent Muslim community. And it's talking about those people who were fighting you, evicting you from your homes. And I'll quote another verse, chapter 60, verse 8, 60, verse 8. Allah forbids you not with regard to those who fight you not for your faith, nor drive you out from your homes from dealing kindly and justly with them. For Allah loves those who are just. And Allah only forbids you with regard to those who fight you for your faith and drive you out of your homes and support others in driving you out. So you see, this is the context in which all these verses regarding fight them appears. Because I have shown in my quote of chapter 9, if they do not fight you, then don't fight them. So you see, the verses from the Quran alone remove completely this, the foundation upon which Robert's argument is based. It is this wholesale, this is what Muslims believe, this is the Quranic ayah, here it is. You have to believe my interpretation of it. And what I have shown is even in the verses, in the earlier verses in chapter 9, because in 929 is the first place where the term people of the book is mentioned. This is true. But if you look at the rest of the context, when it's talking about fighting, those who do not believe in Allah and the last day, I mean, at least Islam, Muslims believe that Jews, Jews accept belief in the one God. So when it's talking about those who do not believe in Allah, it's talking about the pagans. And we learn from the earlier verses in chapter 9 that those are pagans who were actively engaged in hostilities against Muslims. Okay, and then, you, then he, he started to quote uh, some of the other scholars to try to say that there is reason where you're supposed to fight them, and you will find that, of course. This is a war tradition in Islam, and it is no different than the war tradition of other great civilizations. In fact, and currently in our own civilization, I mean, don't we believe, don't we, it's hard to say we don't preach war, 
considering the U.S., and I'm very pro-U.S., God bless the U.S., but, I mean, the U.S. has been involved in some kind of war since World War II, right? So uh, it's hard to say, well, we don't do it, but yet we're engaged in active hostilities in Muslim lands, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm not using that as an argument against uh, Robert's position. I'm just illustrating. Uh, speaking of my jihad, he tried to do the guilt by example. He says, this is a Hamas-linked group that's really bad, and if you click on their link, your computer will blow up. I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, I have nothing to do with care. I couldn't care less about care. Um, this is a, 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 an, a, an attempt by Muslims to denounce terrorism and violent extremism. And there are many people trying to do this, but you see we run into this problem of people then hijacking the hashtag. I don't want to make this about care or my jihad. I'm just saying that there are people who are condemning, uh, but they're being turned down. Uh, we're at three and a half seconds, uh, three and a half minutes. Uh, and I, as I mentioned in my first uh, exchange or first opening, I talked about the history. Like, look at Omar, the Caliph Omar in Jerusalem. Again, this idea that Muslims are supposed to be at war and subjugate all people, non-Muslims that is. How do you explain that Omar, Caliph Omar, sieged Jerusalem, did not destroy it, did not take over with violence and brutality, invited the Jews back to Jerusalem after the Christians had exiled them? refused to pray in the Christian churches, lest people made the claim that, look, Omar, Omar made the claim upon this church. If it was about war and subjugation, how could that even happen? So again, I, I'm, I'm on four and a half. I'm going to reiterate again. I, I read the verses from chapter 9, chapter 60, other verses, which directly, directly refute the idea that you have to fight them because they're non-believers. Nay, it, you fight them when they are fighting you. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mohamed. Well, Robert. you know, uh, here again, don't believe me. Let's go to the Islamic authorities. Al-Azhar University in Cairo is uh, the foremost institution in Sunni Islam. It was praised right after 9-11 by the New York Times as a beacon of Islamic moderation. And I have here a legal manual, uh, Umdara Salik, Reliance of the Traveler, which is certified by Al-Azhar. I have here says here, we certify that the above-mentioned translation, that is the one I've got here, corresponds to the Arabic original and conforms to the practice and faith of the Orthodox Sunni community. Conforms to the practice and faith of the Orthodox Sunni community. Now, Mubin, you've just been speaking a great deal about defensive jihad and claimed that there is no offensive jihad. Certainly there is defensive jihad. There is the command in 2239 and 68 in the Quran to uh, fight against those who have attacked or supposedly attacked the Muslims. But there is also uh, offensive jihad, as uh, this manual certified by Al-Azhar as conforming to the practice and faith of the Orthodox Sunni community. It says that the Muslims have the responsibility to make war upon Jews, Christians, and Zoroastrians, provided they first invited them to enter Islam in faith and practice. And if they will not, then invited them to enter the social order of Islam by paying the non-Muslim poll tax, the jizya, which is the, uh, the, while remaining in their ancestral religion, until they become Muslim, or else pay the non-Muslim poll tax. And then they quote 929 in support of this idea. And so we have Al-Azhar University certifying a manual of Islamic law from the Shafi'i school that tells Muslims to wage war against Jews, Christians, and Zoroastrians until they convert to Islam or submit and pay this tax and submit to dimitude, and it's solely on the basis of their being non-Muslim. There is nothing in here about doing this only if the non-Muslims attack you. This is pure offensive jihad. We also have uh, Ibn Kathir on the celebrated verse of tolerance, there's no compulsion in religion. And Ibn Kathir says this, that there is no compulsion in religion, it means do not force anyone to embrace Islam because it is clear and its proofs and evidences are manifest. That sounds great. But then it goes on to say, this verse is abrogated by the verse of fighting. You should be called to fight against a people given to great warfare, then you shall fight them or they shall surrender. Allah also says, O Prophet, strive hard, jihada, against the disbelievers and the hypocrites and be harsh against them. That's at Talbot chapter 9, verse 73. And fight the disbelievers who are close to you, let them find harshness in you. Ibn Kathir goes on to explain, all people of the world should be called to Islam. If any one of them refuses to do so or refuses to pay the jizya, they should be fought till they are killed. Now, see that 
it's all the people of the world are caught to, called to Islam, and if they refuse to become Muslim, they are fought till they pay the jizya or they are killed. Nothing about defending yourself against them. This is pure offensive warfare. Now, as far as making an analogy between this and the wars that the United States has fought, I was never a supporter of the uh, ridiculous and self-defeating adventures in Iraq and Afghanistan, but the reality is that the uh, United States has not been fighting aggressive wars of con a conquest, contrary to leftist hysteria. There is no col American colony in the Middle East that is placed there with the U.S. flag and about to become the 51st state. There is absolutely no connection, no analogy between that and this aggressive war of conquest that Islam mandates in the Quran and that many, many Muslim authorities uh, are saying ought to be fought. Maududi, Maulana Maududi, the Pakistani jihad theorist and politician of the 20th century, he said the purpose for which the Muslims are required to fight is to put an end to the rule of the unbelievers so that the latter are unable to rule over people. The authority sh to rule should only be vested in those who follow the true faith, that is, Islam. And so, in other words, the non-Muslims have no right to rule. He actually said this in another place. Non-Muslims have absolutely no right to seize the reins of power in any part of God's earth, nor to direct the collective affairs of human beings. And if they do, Muslims have the obligation to fight them. So, in other words, the Muslim must always seek to rule over the non-Muslims, to subjugate them. Uh, to say here again that care is fighting against this and denouncing it is completely false. They're just changing the subject. They're saying that jihad is really just romping through the daisies or playing skip rope with your daughter. But they are not saying anything about the jihad violence that is being fought in the name of Islam all over the world. They're not even addressing that. And so it's all very well that Zahra Balu might think that jihad is making cookies, but that doesn't stop the violent jihadis. And that is the great problem before us. Uh, Mubin, I will turn it over to you for a three-minute crossfire whenever you're ready. Sure. Uh, okay, fire. Um, romping through the daisies. I like that one. Uh, just quickly with my jihad and care. Again, I have no ties to them. I really couldn't care less about them. I'm sure they don't have very uh, high views of me anyway. But what I do appreciate is the attempt to differentiate between jihad and terrorism. And this is something that is necessary and is being done. Now, what you did is, you see, you, you, you again quoted some scholars, and, and Umdat al-Salik is a work of the Shafi'i school. Now, I know, I know many Shafi'is, uh, and they study Umdat al-Salik. In fact, under Nuh Hamim Keller, who probably that's the English version that you have, uh, these people are Sufis. Uh, they certainly don't understand the verse as you have suggested. They will record what scholars have said on such and such verses, and you will find a multiplicity of scholarly opinion on these verses. Like I showed you earlier, and uh, you're right, I wasn't quoting uh, Qurtubi, I was quoting Tabari, uh, in fact, or actually I was quoting Qurtubi when I said Qurtubi regarding do not let the hatred between you and others cause you to be unjust in your dealings. Qurtubi says this verse also proves that the disbelief of non-Muslims must not prevent us from being just to them. Now you're suggesting that while well, just in this case refers to Jizya and Dhimma, and this is not stated here uh, in this verse. In fact, if you look at as it goes on, it, it is not permissible for us to retaliate in the same manner, even if they kill our women and children and cause sorrow to befall us. So he's talking about the concept of fighting in war. That's what he's talking about being just. Do not transgress the bounds of fighting. Um, then you, okay, uh, I'm not going to talk about offensive wars, and it's funny about no U.S. colonies. Well, while it's true that no U.S. flag directly flies over their embassies. I mean, this is something, this is what grand strategy is all about, right? I'm very much into Western influence into the Muslim world, the good things that the Western, uh, Western society has. Um, but, but to say that this kind of uh, expeditionary um, enterprise does not exist is not true. Um, what we see today in our context today is, is lesser than it was a thousand some odd years ago. You might, you will see these things of slaves and vimmies. Uh, you can't build a church. You can't build a church too high. You will find these things. But we're talking about today and now and people today and now, especially those who study Om Dato Salik, they don't then say, aha, now we must go and declare jihad and force jizya out of the Christians and Jews. They, they, they don't do this. And those people who are out fighting, they don't quote 
Umda to Salik and others, they quote, they, they base their, their aggression on grievances, not necessarily Quranic verses, you see. This is, a, this is a very important thing to understand. It's not always about citing verses and doing it because of that. They fight you because they perceive you are fighting them. Thank you, Mubin. Uh, your time's actually just about up. Uh, we'll turn it back over to Robert for a three-minute crossfire. Okay, you actually said that you quoted scholars saying the contrary. You still haven't. Not even one. You keep quoting this one, one, one line about how we should do justice, which uh, is, just means implement Sharia. If you can find me some place where he directly contradicts the Sharia provisions, which present themselves as justice, then I'll accept your point. But you still haven't done it. Uh, as far as uh, the forbidding the building of churches, it's bitterly ironic what you're saying in light of the fact that the uh, building of churches is indeed impeded and violently so today, now. In Egypt, uh, Christians try to build a church and Muslim mob shows up and burns it down. That happened like last week, you know, and it's happened more than once in recent months. And even in Turkey, which is supposed to be so westernized and secular, or at least it used to be, it's extraordinarily difficult for Christians to get a permit to build a church because of the lingering influence of the Sharia provision that non-Muslims are forbidden to build new houses of worship. And of course, all the uh, jihadis quote grievances. That's because defensive jihad is the order of the day until the caliphate is restored, because only the caliph is authorized to wage offensive jihad. But what I'm arguing tonight, what I'm showing from the Islamic sources, from an abundance of Islamic sources, is that offensive jihad is an element of Islamic theology. And this is why they want to restore the caliphate, so that offensive jihad can then be waged again. But until then, they have to retail all these grievances to justify their jihads, because all jihad technically is defensive today, but this is not a matter of theological reform. It's just a matter of the condition of the Islamic world and the fact that there is no caliph today. And so the uh, problem with what you're saying is that you haven't backed any of it up. That uh, whether it was Qurtubi or Tabari who said that the, we have to do justice. Justice in Islam, and I would ask you to contradict this if you dare, is equated with Sharia. And you quote this, you say, well, they're Sufis, and Sufis understand this differently. Well, let's go to the leading Sufi, one of the greatest Muslims who ever lived, Al-Ghazali, the founding figure, of the towering figure of Sufism. He said this, one must go on jihad at least once a year. One may use a catapult against the non-Muslims when they're in a fortress, even if among them are women and children. One may set fire to them or drown them. So that contradicts what you were saying about the women and children. If a person of the Ahl al-Kitab, the people of the book, is enslaved, his marriage is immediately revoked. One may cut down their trees. One may destroy their useless books. Jihadists may take his booty, whatever they decide. Now, this is al-Ghazali, the leading Sufi in Islamic history. And Sufis were at the forefront of the jihad in Chechnya for centuries. And so you say that, well, Sufis, they reject this, uh, this uh, book from al-Azhar, fine then they can quote al-Ghazali and go on jihad as well. And the problem is, they have. And your time is up, Robert. Turn it right back over to Mubin. Mubin, you have six minutes for your closing statement. Six minutes okay. for your... Okay. Um, okay, let me read the verse again for you, or the, the commentary from Al-Qurtubi. He says, the verse proves that the disbelievers of non-Muslims must not prevent us from being just. Now, you make the argument that just equals implementing provisions of Sharia. You see, this is not stated anywhere. This is your interpretation. And if I continue reading his section, he directly talks about retaliating in war. So the context of that statement is not deal justly with them, meaning impose jizya on them. This is not stated by Qurtubi here. So you are, you are forcing this interpretation on Secondly, you talk about Christian uh, churches, et cetera, in Egypt, et cetera. And there are a lot, there's a lot of political instability in these countries. I would argue against whether or not you want to blame religion because of this or politics. But I would reference a very recent, uh, the Moroccan king upgraded a synagogue, a hundred, several hundred year old synagogue in Morocco using state funds. So this idea that, again, this is how it is across the board, this is not true. Um, you, you're quoting these scholars, okay? And what I have tried to do is 
I will acknowledge that you're going to find many scholars who have these things to say. Al-Ghazali is writing literally almost a thousand years ago when he's talking about catapulting people, you know, catapulting into fortified cities. This is because of the way that people lived back then. They lived in fortified cities, women and children, people all lived within the greater courtyard of the, the, the walls of the citadel or whatever it was. So again, look at it in its context. Uh, you're, you're again back to the verses. This is, I think, very important for to remove the foundation of your argument. Your argument, which is that the Quran teaches, that's what I heard. The Quran teaches, and you didn't quote anything from the Quran. You've only quoted that one verse, which is your go-to verse, 929. You haven't quoted any other verses from the Quran. You said Ibn Jauzi said, and then I said, well, Al Qurtubi said, and then you said, well, Umdat Salik writes. And then I said, well, Al-Tabari says, you see, it becomes a he said, she said, because I have shown you, I have shown you, I've read not just the one verse. Al-Tabari also talks about this. Ibn Kathir says, do not let your hatred for people cause you to be unjust. He says, Me, uh, he says, be just that is closer to piety. So, you know, if one says one thing and another one says another thing, all that proves is that there is a difference of opinion over those verses. What there is not a difference of opinion of is the content of the Quran itself. That's why I came to the verses, specifically chapter 9. So I think that we can, we can I don't like to use the phrase kill two birds with one stone. I don't believe in killing birds with stones, um, not one, let alone two. But showing the verses from 1 to 4 to 6 to 7, showing that there, is, there are mitigating factors the fact, and I, I hope you don't deny this because I, we can read the verses again if you need. Uh, the fact that there are mitigating factors, specifically if they fight you, uh, if you're in a peace treaty with them, don't fight them. That proves that the Quran cannot teach war and subjugation against people just because they're non-believers. I gave historical examples. The Christians of Najran that came to the Prophet, peace be upon him, the Prophet invited them into the, into the mosque to pray. If it was about war and subjugation, how could he have even extended this to them? And if we go later on, after the Prophet had, had passed on, again, Omar in Jerusalem, I bring this up a second time, you did not even touch it because you realize that if it was about war and subjugation, Omar would have bombarded the city, laid waste to everyone, and sold whoever was left over or taken into captivity who, who, else, who was not left over. But in fact, he did none of those things. So it's fine what you think Ibn Jawzi said and what Amda Tusalik says, but I go with what the Quran says, primarily because it's what the Quran teaches. I went with what the Quran said. I went with the actual historical example by the caliph, who I am pretty sure understands the Quran and its message better than Al Ibn Jawzi, Al Shafi'i, and uh, and writings like Amdat al Salik. Um, so, again, the verses themselves show mitigating factors, and the fact that there are mitigating factors proves unequivocally, I would say, that Islam does not call for war and subjugation just because they don't believe. Read the verses again if you have to. Chapter 9, verse 1 onwards. Thank you. Thank you, Mubin. Uh, Robert, closing Thank statement. You. Uh, yeah. You know, a funny thing, Mubin. Um, you were saying without any support at all, it's just your uh, bare assertion that Qurtubi uh, has a different understanding of justice from what is the content of Islamic law. And I thought, well, you know, that's, that's really remarkable that a uh, pious Muslim would depart from Islamic law and not equate it with justice. And so I just happened to be looking at this uh, book that is certified by Al-Azhar that we've been talking about, Umdad As-Salik, and it's actually the chapter in which the instructions about jihad warfare against unbelievers and their subjugation as dhimmis is called justice. And so uh, obviously Al-Azhar thinks that justice means warfare against and subjugation of unbelievers. They don't have any problem with it. Uh, I, I, I hope you will take up this error with them and sh show them the uh, error of their ways. Uh, you're wrong that I only quoted 929. I actually also quoted 95, 973, and 9123. And let's go to some more. I have here 839. Fight them until there is no more fitna, that is disbelief, polytheism, unrest, whatever. And the religion is all for Allah. Now that is the context of the peace treaty. When the religion is all for Allah, when the non-Muslims have been either converted to Islam or subjugated, then of course you don't fight them. 
And that's what happens, what, what is being discussed at these verses you so love, the beginning of chapter 9. It's funny how you keep saying 9, 1 through 4, and 6 and 7. Because 5, of course, says, slay the unbelievers wherever you find them, unless they become Muslim, submit to the regular prayers, and pay the poll tax, pay the alms tax, and so on. And you mentioned the Christians of Najran and how generous Muhammad was to them. Where are they? Where are their descendants now? Is there a thriving Christian community in Najran today? Why, no, there isn't. Golly, what happened to those people? Do you think maybe they were waged war against and forcibly converted to Islam or subjugated as dhimmis until the misery of dimitude made it such that they converted simply to have a chance to have a decent life? I think that is what happened to them. And that, what happened to them was in a, that is what happened to them, and it was in accord with the teachings of the Quran and the teachings of Islamic law that flow from the Quran. Also, as far as Umar goes, Umar, when he went to Jerusalem, you're saying if he had meant to subjugate the non-Muslims there, then he wouldn't have been so nice. Well, actually, he wasn't. The reality is that according to Islamic tradition, the historical value of this is quite dubious, he is the originator of the Pact of Umar, which is the foundation of the system of dimitude, which denies basic rights to non-Muslims, denies them the right to build new houses of worship or to repair old ones, denies them the right to have authority over Muslims so they can't get a decent job and are relegated to the most menial jobs in society. They, cannot, they have to pay this tax and so on. That's Umar. And then you say, uh, I think Umar knows more about uh, the Quran and Islam than uh, as Suyuti or Ibn Juzai or all these other authorities that I've been quoting. Well, how is it that they all get it wrong? Why is it that Islam is so frequently misunderstood by the people who are most dedicated to applying it? And that is the thing that I would, I'm going to conclude with uh, in this section tonight, that uh, what's very strange about this that you're arguing is that so many Muslims don't get it. And what I don't understand is why it's so hard for Muslims to understand that Islam is really teaching peace and love and hugs and kisses and happiness. Why is it? that if jihad is really romping through the daisies, that they somehow think it has to do with guns and warfare. How did these misunderstandings arise? I didn't make them up. As much as your friends and, uh, and allies would like to claim that I have, and as the Organization of Islamic Cooperation has tried to claim that non-Muslims, Islamophobes, are criminally linking Islam with terrorism, it's Muslims who link Islam with terrorism. They're the ones who have done it. We are just reporting on it. And come on, you've got to admit, that it is th this linkage is based on copious quotations from the Quran and from scholars of Islam. And so this is not an endorsement of their view. I wish that you would prevail and convince all your fellow Muslims that Islam has nothing to do with warfare and subjugation. The problem that you face is that the textual evidence against you is very great. And instead of denying that and pretending that it isn't so, which only impugns your own credibility, your best chance is to turn to them and to tell them that it's not just to give an alternative view of jihad, that's not good enough, but to explain to them why their view of jihad is wrong and why they are misunderstanding and misinterpreting the Quran. But misunderstanders of Islam abound in the world, and they abound in the world precisely because this is what the Quran teaches, warfare against and the subjugation of unbelievers. The material you adduced about defensive jihad does not and has never been understood in Islamic theology to cancel or to abrogate the material enjoining offensive jihad. As a matter of fact, Ibn Ishaq, Muhammad's first biographer, Ibn Qayyam, and all the way up to the present day, the recent Chief Justice of Saudi Arabia who made, they all have said that there are three stages of jihad delineated in the Quran. The first is tolerance, the second is defensive jihad, and the third and final stage that is valid for all time is offensive jihad. That is the stage that the, non, that the uh, Sal Salafis, the Muslim Brotherhood, Al-Qaeda, and the rest of them are trying to reintroduce into the world by restoring the caliphate. And this is a, an understanding of Islam that is unfortunately all too mainstream. And so while I wish you well and I wish you success, if you are sincere in your claim that Islam does not teach this, it is not me you have to convince. It is the great majority of the jihadis in the world who understand quite otherwise.
Well, the formal part of the debate is now over. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. We will take a 60-second break, and when we return, we will open up our phone lines for you to call in, 248-416-1300. Uh, again, uh, also feel free to visit abnsat.com, where this debate will be uploaded. Um, again, abnsat.com. We'll be back in 60 seconds. Stay tuned. You are watching ABN. Hi, this is David Wood from Jesus or Muhammad. Uh, as I'm sure you've heard, ABN uh, has some significant financial needs. Uh, a lot of the equipment here is either outdated or damaged, and it's affecting the broadcast. I'll say ABN does a great job with what they have, but uh, they could be doing much more if they had uh, some uh, newer equipment, some newer cameras. Um, and so I encourage everyone to uh, support the work that's going on here. We'd like to have more broadcasts, more shows, uh, more programs, and uh, we can only do that uh, through financial donations. And so I encourage everyone out there uh, to contribute whatever you can. Um, and uh, beyond all of this, uh, a apart from the, the, the technical uh, needs, there's also the security needs given the increase in threats. And so uh, if ABN is going to continue carrying on this work, they're going to need your support as they always have. And so uh, as, you, uh, you know, as we end out the year and you're thinking uh, about where you'd like to donate, uh, I don't think you'll find a better place than ABN. Welcome back to Debate Night Live on ABN. Uh, at this time, we will open up the calls for the viewers to call in, share your comments, and ask your questions to both of our debaters. Um, our first caller with us right now, we have Osama. Welcome to the show, Osama. Uh, what's your question for us? Well, I actually have a few statements I would like to share with you guys quickly. Number one, our dear Muslim friend here, he needs a lot of help because he learned Arabic in a couple of years. He needs another 20 years to know Islam before he talk about Islam. When you talk about, when you talk about this uh, contradiction among Muslim scholars, Robert Spencer is quoting you one, and you quoting another verse, two different interpretations to two different verses in the Quran. I can give you the same contradiction in one verse of the Quran, chapter 47 and verse 35. You know what Allah said? Do not be weak and do not call for peace when you have the upper hand. So Muslims do not have upper hand like yourself can can betray the American and act like a nice guy to America and can work for FBI. But the time will come, when the right time will come, when Muslim in America have the upper hand, you yourself, who are helping the FBI today to have victory over the terrorists, you yourself will be a terrorist. Muslim, call for peace when they do not have the upper hand. So I can show you many verses in the Quran where you see different interpretations of verses. When Muslim have upper hand, they are not loving and peaceful. When Muslim do not have the upper hand, they are loving and peaceful. And literally, you talk about Omar and Jerusalem as you were there, and you saw what Omar did to the Christian and to the Jews of Jerusalem. You have no clue. Read the fact of Omar to know what Omar did to my home country, Egypt. What Omar did to the Christian and the Jew of Jerusalem. Yes, indeed. He actually built them homes with, the, with, with, with a lot of garden around them to make sure they come, come back. That, that's really, you know, you guys are just full of hogwash Islam. Now. Osama, ask, like, Osama, before uh, you go on to your next point, let's give um, both um, speakers an no, opportunity no, no, to, summer, this is summer, to this is summer. I have a question for my friend here, just a quick one. I'm not yes, going to go, go right ahead. I want him to tell me, I want him to tell me, what does this statement say in English? I'm going to give him a word in Arabic, and I want him to read to me what it says in English. قال أبو عبيدة كل آية فيها فرق للقتال فهي مكية منسوخة بالقتال. Because he's been caught in Al-Qurtubi, and I'm glad he's be he believes in Al-Qurtubi. Here's what Al-Qurtubi said about Abu Ubaidah. كل آية فيها طرق للقتال فهي مكية منسوخة بالقتال. Now, can he Let's tell get... me exactly what this Arabic said? And if not, I would like to translate it to him right now. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Thank you, Osama. Mubin, the mic's all yours. Yeah, Osama, calm down a bit. Uh, <laughs> you know, he's talking about different interpretations and... All of this shows is that there is a difference of opinion. I mean, if, if you have not studied Islam, 
you maybe you won't know this, but there is a lot of difference of opinion in Islam. There are four schools of law. And when Robert is talking about Umdatus Salik, uh, Umdatus Salik says this, therefore uh, uh, Al-Azhar me Al-Azhar is endorsing the war and subjugation of believers. Umdatus Salik is, a, is one of many works by the Shafi'i school of law and it is done in English. And so Al-Azhar said, yes, this is a faithful translation. So I, I don't see how it's an endorsement of of, of, of Al-Azhar policy, uh, just, just on, the, on the topic of different uh, interpretations. When you're going to give me talking about Abu Ubaidah and people who are writing from the times in which war is ongoing, you will find them speaking in a way in which it's clear war is their context. And this is the entire argument. When people are fighting them, they will refer to the other, they will, re, they will quote their scriptures in a way that validates their particular context. So to show me that Abu Ubaidah is talking about jihad and how every verse has a portion uh, associated to jihad, this is not really making the argument because what you need to show is that, you know, your average everyday Muslim is you know, secretly planning, I love this, you know, you're working for the FBI and one day you're going to turn on them and become a, become a terrorist. You know, I mean, if you look for a boogeyman everywhere, you're going to see him everywhere. Thanks. Robert, any comments? Yeah, you know, uh, Lupin, there you go again with this reductionism of my argument. Uh, what I said was plain. This video will be available. People will be able to watch it and check what you're saying. So it's probably not a good idea to so brazenly misrepresent what I say just a few minutes after I say it. Uh, you said in the first place that I uh, only quoted this uh, Shafi'i manual from Al-Azhar. Actually, I quoted Maliki and Hanbali authorities as well. I have Hanafi authorities here also. You say that it's just one interpretation of many, and yet you still have not adduced a single quotation, not even one, to show that, this, that, that Muslims should not wage war against and subjugate unbelievers. Just to say they should work for justice is not enough because it is common in Islam to equate justice with Islamic law, which mandates this warfare against and subjugation where, of unbelievers. Where is this, where is this that, association? Excuse me, I never interrupted you. Excuse me. My apologies. You say that, uh, there, that this Umdara Salik is one of many Shafi'i books. Fine. Produce another. Give us a quote. Show us even one that, does not, that says Muslims must not wage war against and subjugate unbelievers. Could we just have even one? Can I give it? Let's, let's actually move on because we have a lot of uh, oh. calls coming in. If we have some time at the end, I'll give you both an opportunity to re-comment. But right now we have uh, Adrian, I believe, on air with us. Welcome to the program. Uh, hello. Good evening. Uh, my, my question or comment is for Mubin. And um, the way I understood your, your main point is that the uh, majority of, of, of the Muslims uh, uh, believe in, in the uh, understand the Quran as being a message of love and not war, uh, and uh, 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 that's contrary to the over 20,000 uh, uh, deadly uh, t terrorist attacks that have been done all over the world uh, since 9/11, and uh, 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 a lot of your arguments stemmed from 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 the point of view that. Uh, because one scholar doesn't agree or a couple of scholars don't agree on this side, therefore we, we can't make any generalized kind of statements. Well, this kind of reasoning reminds me of like the medieval arguments of how many angels can sit on the head of the pin. But if we look at the actual physical effects of, of what Islam and of what the Quran has, uh, uh, has uh, brought about in the present day world, uh, all the persecutions of the Christians in, in Egypt, in Somalia, uh, in Malaysia, in, 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 in many countries where Islam is the main religion, uh, where are the uh, Muslim organizations condemning this? Where are the Muslim organizations trying to uh, say, no, this, this, the, the Quran is incorrect? And I understand that uh, uh, you really can't do that because when you're squirming right and left, trying to justify it and trying to change the uh, topic, uh, you can't criticize the Quran because you ultimately believe that it's the infallible world, word of Allah. The, the, the Christian 
Christian religion underwent the Reformation. Islam has never undergone a Reformation. It, it has never un undergone an honest look at itself at these verses that are there without trying to, you know, weasel a lot of, uh, of uh, what's uh, really stated there. Uh, because if it does, it will cease to be Islam. Okay, thank you, sir, for uh, your comment. Uh, Mubin, Mike's all yours. Yeah. We can keep the okay. uh, responses brief because yeah. the uh, calls are coming in. Yep, got it. First of all, I don't justify anything. Uh, I condemn unequivocally the persecution and oppression of Christians. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said that the Vimmi who is persecuted, he will find that I am the prosecutor on the Day of Judgment. So I don't justify any of that oppression. Secondly, I want to make a quick point. You say in the modern world, and this is true, uh, where was the Islamic extremism, terrorism in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s? That was secular Marxist terrorism. So we have something very specific now in this age in which the Islamic supremacist um, movement has come about. And I'm going to say to you that if Islam was about war and subjugation, well, there would have been war and subjugation going on all throughout history, but that's not the case. There's something very specific about this time. And I'm going to say to you that it has very little to do with religion, more so to do with political grievances. That is why you see these things happening in the world in the Muslim world. Thank you. Robert? I, uh, little to say, I just can say that uh, we haven't seen it throughout history. We didn't see it in the 50s and 60s of the 20th century because uh, the Islamic world wasn't strong enough to uh, prosecute the jihad at that time. Islamic law dictates that uh, one must not wage jihad warfare when there's no chance of winning and when the enemy has more than twice your strength. When the West was strong and confident, jihad was in abeyance. Now, when the West is uh, practically suicidally self-critical and uh, not weak militarily, but weak culturally, weak societally, that's now we see the jihad stepping up. Thank you, Robert. Next call, we have Joseph on air with us. Welcome, Joseph. Yes, it is. Uh, welcome. Uh, I just have very quick three points. First point, we find the, uh, the two verses in Quran with the... Uh, Interpretation of all Muslim scholars. The verse 9:29 and the 9:5 about fighting against the non-believer, infidel, and the Christian. Uh, all all Muslim scholars, without one exception, they explain it as it is: the fighting against, the trying to subjugate non-believer, and uh, take the jizya. Three, three options for the Christian and Jew. Jezia, one of the, of the options. But for the infidel, Islam or death. This is all Muslim scholars. Baidawi, Jalalain, Tabari, Zamukhshori, all of them. Second, Muhammad himself, when he tried to uh, attract uh, tribes to follow him, uh, the Rod Anas, Suheli, part two, he told them, if you follow me, God will give you their, la their land. We're going to attack other tribes. You will be given their land and their woman. It is very obvious. This subject already very obvious. And throughout the history, Islam invaded, started with Syria, invaded uh, parts of China, India, Persia, North Africa, Egypt. It is very well known. It, you. Uh, uh, you, you guys talking about something like ABC. It is black and white. <laughs> Thank it you, Joseph. Let's turn, the, let's turn the mic over to uh, Mobin to save time and, and get his comments. Sure. Uh, I'll try to be quick. Uh, quick. Or, you know, Robert, you, you talked about uh, the Muslims will wage jihad when they're strong. And you acknowledged that there was no jihad back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s uh, because the Muslims weren't strong enough, but now they're stronger than... Uh, that makes no sense because, I mean, the Muslim world has generally been weak for a long time. That's the whole reason why you had... Marxist secular governments popping up in the Muslim world. So to say that, I mean, we're weaker now, culturally weaker, but not physically weaker, makes no sense. The invasion argument is also weak. I, I noticed this with the anti-Islamic narrative, and that is, oh, the Muslims were doing this. Well, I'm saying that I, I take a step back and I look at the way everybody was behaving. The Romans were doing this. The Persians were doing this. This is how people did war in those days. So to say that Look at the Muslims doing war in those days. Well, that doesn't make a good argument. So um, that's what I got to say on that. I'll, I'll keep, it, keep it going. This is how people did war in those days. 
but it is only the Islamic community that is doing war that way now. And that's the problem. And uh, really, otherwise, the, just go on because I know we have a lot more callers. Sure, I'll deal we, with the rest later. Okay, and we, and we can come back if we have a few minutes towards the end for um, you both. But right now we have Kevin on air with us. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Hello, how are you doing? Good. What's your uh, question for I have a question for the Sheikh. Um, I'm sure you understand the necessity for, I think it's called NASC or NASC or abrogation. Uh, you mentioned a Surah 68 uh, about being tolerant towards uh, non-Muslims. But if you read the Tafsir of al Jalalain, it says, uh, God does not forbid you in regard to those who did not wage war against you from among the disbelievers on account of religion and did not expel you from your home, that you should treat them kindly and deal with them justly. And it says, this was revealed before the command to struggle against them. Assuredly, God loves the just. So I believe 68 was abrogated, and uh, the Quran is not in order of revelation. I believe Surah 9 is the second from last revealed. So uh, I'm not sure how you would uh, reconcile that in your argument. Uh, also, if, if, if the goal is in Islam, According to Sahih Muslim um, 5917, Muhammad pressed Ali on to uh, fight them, and Ali asked in a loud voice, he said, why, why am I fighting these people? And the Prophet said, fight them until they bear testimony to the fact that there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. So I was wondering if you could respond to that. Thank you, sir. Uh, go right ahead, Mubin. Yeah, um, I, I would have to look at Jalalain's tafsir again to see where he says that this is this is abrogated, and that's fine. I mean, there's a there's a long discussion on abrogation in Nasikh wa Mansukh uh, in the Islamic sources. I'm not going to get into that. Some people say, well, you know, they were they're making these arguments to try to make sense of the verses. That's beyond the purpose of our debate here. Directly to your question, how do you deal with that? I have the Quran in front of me. I deal with the context, the whole context of the Qur'an. So when I see multiple verses, nobody makes the argument that all the verses regarding peaceful conduct, you know, uh, uh, your peace treaties, dealing justly with people with whom you've made peace treaties, nobody says those verses are abrogated. So the general idea that you deal justly with those who deal justly with you still remains. And the other part of the argument is you deal harshly with those who deal harshly with you. So uh, I'm not going to make the argument that Islam is a pacifist religion. Uh, there is definitely a component of offensive, uh, ag aggressive action. This is normal. This is normal in all the great war traditions, if you will. So, uh, so just on that, uh, on the abrogation point, and I think you, you mentioned uh, 5917, Sahih Muslim. Uh, you're going to find many verses, many statements, uh, one saying to Ali, you know, and I have another one you can say, uh, give, uh, I'll give you one. I can quote one from Ali that said, look, don't fight the Abyssinians. Don't fight the Turks. So you can see that belief alone is not sufficient for waging jihad. Oh, sure. There's uh, the whole idea of uh, the takfir and declaring uh, Muslims to be hypocrites or unbelievers and thus fighting against them as well. Uh, certainly, jihad is uh, not restricted to warfare against unbelievers. It's also warfare against Muslims who believe differently. Uh, dealing justly and peace treaties here again, you're going back to the same thing without ever having established that justice in Islam is not Islamic law, which, is warfare, which, it, which uh, mandates warfare against and subjugation of unbelievers, and that the peace treaty in regard to the non-Muslims is the dimma, the pact of protection which mandates their denial of basic rights. And so we come back again. The Quran teaches warfare against and subjugation of unbelievers. Dealing justly is in 839. Fight against them until there's no more fitna and the religion is all, all for Allah. That is not abrogated. That is not canceled. That is not mitigated by verses that say deal justly with people or have peace treaties with them. This is the one that a 839 that uh, is understood in mainstream Islamic theology, all the schools of, of Sunni jurisprudence teach that this is the verse that takes precedence, that verses like it take precedence over ones according to the principle of abrogation as established by Quran chapter 2 verse 106, that that is 
the final stage of jihad, to wage war against and subjugate the unbelievers. And as one of the earlier callers said, the Muslims, when they are weak, are tolerant. I wanted to save this for the end, but I've got to say it, I think, if there's time, that mm -hmm. you know, you said that to say that we're culturally weaker now than we were in the 50s makes no sense. If only that were true. But the whole idea that resisting jihad and resisting Islamic supremacism is some kind of uh, uh, racism or bigotry or hatred, which is what I'm routinely charged with, is an indication that we no longer have the will to fight against this, but we are up against a very martial and determined foe. Why don't we take our next call of the evening. We have Omar on air with us. Welcome to the show, Omar. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you. What's your question for us? I have a question for you guests that I want to know if you can tell me how do you justify the killing of innocent Palestinians in Palestine and the killing of innocent Afghani in Afghanistan. And in another comment, if you can please invite uh, a scholar from Islam, which is Dr. Zakir Naik, or Yusuf has this to your program, then he will answer for all the, you guests or any other people that have a question about Islam. They can answer you very well. Thank you. I'd be, uh, I'd be very happy to debate Dr. Zakir Naik. Uh, most uh, Islamic supremacist spokesmen run from debate with me because obviously they know what I'm saying is true and they fear being exposed. I commend Mubin Sheikh for having the courage to debate me tonight, and I'd be happy to debate Zakir Naik if it could be arranged. As far as killing innocent uh, Palestinians and Afghans, I've never justified such a thing, and uh, such a thing could never be justified. And I hope that you are directing your ire against Hamas in Gaza, which is putting innocent Palestinians in harm's way by deliberately launching jihad attacks against Israelis from civilian areas, placing rocket launchers in school playgrounds and in residential areas so that they will draw retaliatory fire that they can use for propaganda purposes. That is a heinous crime, and I hope that you denounce it. Mubin, any comments on your end? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, I think I know what he was saying, but uh, I don't, I don't uh, support Zakir Naik. Um, uh, I don't, like, like Robert said, of course, there's no justification for killing innocent people whether in the name of politics or freedom or, or religion or whatever it is, right? Right. Thank you. Uh, we'll take our next call. We have Joseph on air with us. Welcome to the show, Joseph. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I will talk with Sheikh. Sheikh, verse number five from Surah Toba. I will read it in Arabic because I have four things I'll tell you. I read in Arabic, you know what I say. This verse, all the uh, imam of Muslims said, this verse, con, uh, uh, this verse did not, uh, cancel all the verses who talk about love and peace. 124 verses cancel in this verse. Number two, verse number 29, uh, Surah why you are a liar? Qatilu, if you translate it in Arabic, it means kill. If you say it fight, that means ta'araku, tashajaru, don't be a liar. Number four, verse number three, verse number 60, Surah Al-Anfal. Wa'addu lahum mastata'atum min quwwatin wa min ribat al-khayl. Muhammad said to Muslim, take weapons and uh, horses for fight. Verse number 65 from Surah Al-Anfal. Ya ayyuha al-Nabi, harrad al-Mu'mini ala al-Qital. Hey, Prophet, teach your Mu'minin to fight, to kill. And I will go take you up, uh, tell you about Umar that he is a good guy. Why Shia did not put it the name of Umar? Because he killed daughter of Muhammad, Fatima Zahra, and he was pregnant with Muhsin. No, and you can read Ashurut al umariya in Jerusalem. That we do it. And Thank you, you sir. Let's let's give because we're running out of time. Thank yeah, you for yeah. Let's, let's give uh, Mubin let's an opportunity. Calm it down a bit, there, sir. Uh, okay, uh, he's talking about verses in which uh, the Muslims are encouraged to fight, and you will find them because there are many instances where the Muslims were being fought against, and so whoever was fighting them, they were to be fought 
in reciprocation. That's the whole theme. Those verses that you see, you know, Robert's been trying to kind of run around and say, oh, you, you know, the, you know, the verse on justice says it's about imposing Sharia on it and just one verse. I mean, there are many, many places where if you'd look at an index and look up justice, you'll find many, many verses and they do not, maybe one or two, you can relate it to the immediate context, but there are so many others that give a general reference to being just in your dealings with other people, in your covenants, and this is exactly what uh, people did. So uh, that's what I really I'm can't say believe those that you were trying to separate justice from Sharia as a believing Muslim. I find that amazing, and I hope that uh, okay, Robert, some of your co-religionists Robert, don't get wind of what Robert, you're saying Robert, there, Robert, because they you, might uh, before... they might take umbrage. Why don't we take our final call of the evening, and then I'll give you both an opportunity to uh, provide any final comments that you have. Uh, right now, we have Curtis on air with us. Welcome to the show, Curtis. Hi. It's uh, actually Chris. Oh, Chris. Welcome, to Chris. <laughs> hey, and I was actually invited by Mubin on Twitter earlier today to come get some, uh, and then we start talking about a RAV4. But... Um, Basically, I want to ask a couple questions here. Is uh, I'm reading a great book, and it's not one of yours, Robert. It's actually uh, by Alan Dershowitz, even though, Robert, you have many great books. It's called The Case for Israel. And I've learned many things reading this book, such as, um, you know, Palestinians weren't even considered Muslim by other Muslim countries until Israel became a nation. Like, in fact, in the 1800s, the Jews actually outnumbered the Muslims in that country. So, we're actually running out of time. Did you have a, a particular question that you can ask to both of our speakers this evening? Yes. Uh, basically, I want to bring up the Armenian genocide because Mubin challenged Robert to come up with other times where Muslims were slaughtering people. And then uh, Sahih Bukhari, 0452176, the day of resurrection will not arrive until the Muslims make war against the Jews, blah, 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 blah. Basically, the very holy book, the Quran, and the teachings are very racist. And how can you say Islam is peace if their very teachings and their leaders uh, say we must kill all the Jews? Okay. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Mubin, I will uh, hand the mic to you. Uh, just take about 60 seconds to answer this and then just provide the audience any final comments that you have. The day shall not arrive until there's a fight with the Jews and Christians. Uh, I interpret that, me and many others, that this refers to an end time prophecy. Uh, personally, I believe we're living in those days where Judaism, Christianity, and Islam will become the three major players that determine uh, the, the future of the world, really. And it will be, this is the gnashing of the teeth, the brother against brother. Uh, so I'll just make the statement on that. And just to close, if I may, um, look, again, Robert keeps trying to make the argument that I haven't said this and I haven't said that. I've quoted many verses, and he will only come back to that particular verse and its use of just. But I don't just look at that verse regarding just, being just. There are many, there are dozens of places, literally in the Quran, where the term for justice is used. So the general idea of justice, meaning being fair to other people one-on-one -on -one or as groups, still remains. To What you're trying to do, Robert, is force a very particular understanding onto that verse and to say, ah, any time the word just is used, that's what it should mean. And that is not the case. If, you, if any of you actually go and read the verses, not just the ones that are quoted, but the ones before and after, so you can get a context, you will see that whenever there is mention of fighting and conflict, it is almost always in relation to those people who are fighting you. Um, second point, just on the aggressive uh, jihad or the, the expansive jihad, Again, this is a normal concept in, in human civilization. We ourselves in the West, we have an aggressive Western uh, construct. This is why there are armed, there are, are uh, aircraft carriers uh, waiting outside of countries. It is a show of force. It is a show of force. So this is something that all nations do. I mean, I'm sure the US would like to rule the world and for all intents and purposes, it does. But the idea that Muslims can't do that, or if Muslims did that at some point, that's proof of them being really, really bad and out to subjugate everyone. This is, again, proven false by the simple fact that in many places, Jews, you know, Robert said earlier on that the Dhimmis were, were, were given low jobs and they weren't allowed to make a decent living for themselves. Robert, this is very easily verifiable. You know, the historians have... have I've talked about many Jewish personages who had high 
status jobs. Salah Hadin, the, the great general against the evil I'm going to have to turn the mic back over to Robert for some final comments. You have about 60 seconds and we have to end the show. Yeah, Mubin, there was a Jew who was named vizier of Granada in 1066. And the Muslims were so enraged, the Jew was holding authority over them that they carried out a pogrom and killed 4,000 Jews because they knew that it, this was against Islamic law. Uh, as far as, uh, once again, you're just not being uh, honest about what I've said. And people will be able to watch the videotape. I've actually quoted 839, 95, 929, 973, and 923, and uh, refuted your uh, uh, interpretations of 2239 and 68. And there are plenty of other Quran verses that we could bring to bear had we more time. And also, uh, as far as the, uh, you're going back and acting like these things are matters of history, in Pakistan, the colloquial term for Christians is street sweepers, because they only hold the most menial jobs in the society, because of the restrictions of dimitude. The idea that the Quran teaches warfare against and subjugation of unbelievers is unfortunately all too common in Islam. And I challenge you to do something about it instead of demonizing those who are. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Mubin, for joining us on the program. Thank you, Robert, and thank you to our audience for tuning in to another live episode of Debate Night. Again, feel free to give us a call at the studio if you have any questions or comments at 248-416-1300. This program will be um, uh, uplinked on abnset.com and also jihadwatch.org. Uh, for more information, uh, just give us a call at the studio. Until next time, we hope you have a great night.